Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. And, of course, the third hour on Thursdays, we have Tim Alexander, Lord Sterling. His website, Europe Business, was 1S.blogspot.com. You can uh, Google Lord Sterling, at S-T-I-R-L-I-N-G, and you'll get his blog, Amazing Military Geopolitical and Strategic Analysis. What's the latest in the uh, blogosphere in terms of the nastiness of the Middle East? And what's uh, transpiring as we hurdle headlong toward um, some really bad decisions by some really bad people. Well, uh, my class this morning, I asked my I asked my students. I said, "What potentially earth-shaking, history-making event has happened in less than the last 24 hours?" And they kind of looked around, and one guy said, uh, "One student said, well, uh, the Obama Romney debate." And I said, wrong. I said, just a little thing. I said, it's not certain yet, just maybe, but World War III might have started uh, last night. And they kind of looked at me. Um, What happened uh, was this. Someone, and uh, the Syrians have not, uh, although the Turks claim that the Syrians have said they've admitted it, they have not. Uh, they're investigating. Someone fired a less than a half dozen rounds of a mortar uh, into a Turkish border city just across the border. It almost certainly was a false flag attack from one of the uh, NATO terrorist groups that uh, Turkey has been funneling into Syria uh, because in that area there was a battle going on. In any case, uh, five uh, Turkish civilians were killed and several were wounded. And the Turks have used that. Um, of course, for all we know, the event never even happened. Uh, and I'm reminded of the so-called Polish attack on a German radio station that began uh, World War II. But anyway, um, the Turks responded with an artillery barrage last night, and they are continuing the barrage today. Now, the Turkish parliament met, uh, and the Turkish parliament uh, authorized the use of military force uh, into Syria, going into Syria, attacking Syria. Virtually, it was a declaration of war, although the Turkish prime minister says we, we won't start the war. Um, Turkey is a member of NATO. Uh, NATO had an emergency overnight meeting in Brussels and uh, threatened to respond uh, and come to the defense of Turkey from the Syrian aggression. Now, you have to keep in mind, Syria is the victim. Uh, NATO has been funneling. uh, Yeah, NATO has been a perpetrator, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, the all the latest, and I've I've been checking I uh, Tim, I hope everything on on the net, all the news uh, sources from around the world. Uh, no one is reporting that the uh, shelling has stopped, and uh, the current reports are that it continues. Uh, we'll see uh, if. This continues into tomorrow. We will be speaking of the Third World War having begun on the third of October yesterday. Uh, right. My guess is maybe we will will maybe crawl out from under this one, but it has everything on a hair trigger for the next event, and you know they can fake the event. It cannot even take place, and they can say it takes place. Or one of their terrorists on the Turkish side can lob a, you know, you, you can pull up in a uh, uh, pickup truck with a mortar uh, in the back, unload it, pop it on the ground, pop uh, a half dozen rounds off, and be gone in less than 60 seconds if you're good at it. Uh, so the, we're very close to the Third World War. Russia's already. Uh, has uh, intervened to prevent uh, the Security Council passing any resolution. Uh, She's been warning quite vehemently against uh, attacking Syria and Iran. Um, You have to keep in mind that Turkey may have a problem. Uh, They've already had demonstrations. A lot of people don't want a war. The the Ayawites, which... Uh, are the, um, the, 
the, the they're the same as the uh, as Bashir Assad, is our, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, is, is in our white, and uh, there are something like twenty five percent of the Turkey's population is all white. That, that's, now here, now let's back up a bit. Uh, you said something extremely significant, which you often do, but let's roll back. If 25% of Turkey in Ankara, which is one of their major cities, and is an Alawite, and they're the same religious group as Bashar al-Assad, uh, and they're tear gassing the Alawites because they want peace, wouldn't that suggest that Turkey is acting as a proxy for NATO and not in the best interests of Muslim countries or even Turkey? Plus, they well, now course. inflamed the situation, so there there are safe cities inside Syria for the Kurds, the Kurdish rebels. So what Turkey is doing is inflaming a situation that's causing an increase in civil war inside Turkey, where they've been persecuting and killing Kurds for decades, including the uh, PKA, which are Marxists. And, of course, now they're armed to the teeth up in northern Iraq because they have lots of oil, so they have money to buy guns and weapons. What we're doing is by inflaming the situation, not only are we putting in the Muslim Brotherhood, but we're guaranteeing the formation of Kurdistan, which is going to chew up southeastern Turkey, uh, absorb northern Iraq well, as part of the now. We want that, by the way. Right, and but but it, I, I think that the again I remember this from uh, uh, the policy of the West is if we can balkanize and break them down to little mini nations or mini states, we can deal with them more easily with their international uh, oil companies, etc. Yes. And and you can easily overrun our. <clears throat> terrorize or dictate to a, a tiny state as opposed to a significant uh, state. Uh, you know, Iran has 75 million people. Uh, so it, that, that's one of the problems with Iran. Is it, it's, it's, it's this really big country with oil resources. It's closer to 80 million now. It's a, and most, by the way, half the population are under 30. Half the population are under 30. So it's got a, a large young population. Most of them are pretty westernized. Uh, this idea that we have a mullahs and so on, these guys are relics. To be honest with you, if we weren't pushing and persecuting Iran, the, the mullahs would already be gone. They'd be gone a decade ago. Yeah, okay, when so I was in grad school, I, I knew some Iranian students, and uh, they were surprisingly, most of them were surprisingly modern. Uh, a couple were kind of uh, religious, but uh, most were surprisingly modern. Uh, of course, that was back in the days of the Shah, but they didn't like the Shah, and, and most of them didn't like the, the religious fundamentals. But, you know, war is a great generator of debt. Debt is profit to the global banking cartel. And uh, so the, you, you have the uh, impetus for war because what they really want is profit. But beyond that, war is a three-letter word in direct opposition to God. War is, is satanic murder. Uh, the, the last veteran of World War I, uh, one of the last things he said was war is, is simply organized murder. And uh, it is. It's, it's slaughter. It's death. It's evil. It's hate. It's uh, the opposite of God, the opposite of what God wants for his children. And, uh, but it's what Satan wants. Satan is the, the, the fallen angelic being that took a third of the angelic host mm -hmm. with him. And he's interested in hate, death, destruction. Because when he yeah. left God, he left all the good stuff behind. And what's left is pure, raw evil. And uh, yeah, that's Tim, there's a, there's an important down. statement you made. There's an important statement you made about this Turkish artillery. It's not just a little barrage. What you said in the article, and you have it posted up here, is that this barrage is cutting a 10-kilometer strip inside Syria from Turkey. Yes. Yeah. This is, this well, is a really big... Well, they're using 155 millimeter uh, artillery as well as uh, probably some 105 pieces. 155 millimeter artillery. Uh, and most of theirs, uh, they bought from uh, the newer pieces, they bought from South Korea. It's a very good gun system. It has a long range to it. Uh, when 155 millimeter shell falls anywhere near you, you're going to die. Yeah, you'll be ripped apart from the percussion uh, blast or from the shrapnel. Welcome back, and of course... Um, 
Interesting comments you make in the next story. You talked about Israeli seeks destruction of the Middle East, says Iraqi parliamentary speaker Osama al Nujaifa says Israel seeks to create divisions among regional countries with the ultimate goal of destroying the whole I love it when you pronounce Middle these East. names. I don't even try because I, <laughs> I, yeah. I take a meat axe to them. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So what we have is a situation where, of course, Israel is like a battle axe to chop up these countries so it's easy for international corporations to obtain their resources, just like the resources for Iraq were passed over as part of the backroom deal to the China Oil Company, which didn't exist before Gulf War II. Gulf War II basically created the China Oil Company, the fifth largest oil refining and manufacturing company for petrochemicals on the earth, which is part of the deal with China. Those, those resources are now being sold by the Rothschilds to China to be processed and, re- and sold back to the West. Well, so, there's, there's one thing that I, I frequently say to my friends, follow the money, and to a lesser extent, uh, follow the par. But at a certain level, money is power, and power is money, and so forth. Follow the money. And um, you, you very much hit on something there. But you also, there are other factors. I mean, in, in, in the case of Israel, you have these Sabbatean Jews that have uh, that uh, don't really follow the Torah, but follow the, the Tumad, uh, their Tumalic teachings, the, the, which yeah, are the in many cases satanic. Yeah, the Talmud and the Zohar, and basically these two documents set them, as Jesus said, of the synagogue of Satan. They are vipers, they be even the cockatrice, the serpent's egg, uh, children, and uh, they are the, the vital force of the Luciferic power on earth. And people say, oh no, you're anti-Semitic. I said, no, no, I, I'm a Messianic believer, I'm descended from the Middle East. I'm descended from Cohen's. I can tell you, you can't call me anti-Semitic. It's just, you know, it's obscene. It's like calling somebody, you know, anti-black who's black. Uh, it's ridiculous. So what, what people need to understand is I support completely Torah Jews. I support the state of Israel insofar as that the real Aliyah is not supposed to even happen until Jesus returns. But what's happening with the state of Israel, instead of it, it, this hyper-vigorous, hyper-aggressive state, which isn't just trying to negotiate. You know, if Obama was a real leader, like Romney obviously presents himself as a bipartisan leader, he'd call up Bashar al-Assad, Russia and China, and you have to neutralize these weapons and stabilize the situation. This situation is getting increasingly unstable. I expect the next stupid move that Europe will make, as this amplifies, is to put a no-fly zone over Syria, which will guarantee well, if, that if, Syria if, will if, then you, have you to may start... You be right, Dr. Bill, and if they do that, uh, the balloon will go up, and the balloon may go up anyway. Uh, the Syrians know that they that there is a point at which uh, they cannot allow foreigners, uh, their enemies, to cross a certain line, and if that line is crossed, then they have to respond. You have to remember the Syrians are sitting back and taking this. Now they're chewing up the NATO terrorists, and that's exactly what they are. They're they're, they're called the Free Syrian Army, 95% of which are not Syrian. Uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia, through the Brits, the French, and the Americans, are hiring uh, all these poor Arabs from North Africa and the Middle East, and they're paying them somewhere, it varies from 50 to 125,000 each, and uh, to fight for them. And, uh, and to die for them. The, the, the Syrians are eating fire. them up, spitting them out, but they keep sending more and more because they have oodles and gobs of oil money. And uh, Syria is sitting back watching itself being gradually uh, destroyed by all these foreign forces, uh, which ultimately are, are driven by the global banking cartel in Israel. And there is a point at which the Syrians, as well as the Iranians, and we haven't even talked about what's happening in Iran, but it's bad, um, will say, okay, we've got a month or two left after which we will no longer be able to influence or control events. Well, here's what the At Europeans point, did. They, they allowed the Europeans, allowed the Iranians to buy grain. They have an embargo, which is an act of war against Iran. That act of war, when it finally reaches a point where the state is bankrupt and can no longer sell their oil or buy staples to feed their food or buy oil to cook their food, 
as you say, Katie, bar the door, all hell is going to break loose. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they, they've had riots, uh, rioting the last couple of days in Iran. They are now suffering hyperinflation. Uh, they've lost about 75 percent of the value of their currency in the last year, and it's really been accelerating. Uh, in yeah. So, so uh, basically. Um, uh, basically, they have to do something. Uh, they, they've, they've taken one of their major militia groups into Tehran uh, to try to uh, enforce laws appertaining to increasing prices on, on food items and, and speculative things, etc., etc. The mullahs are getting very concerned. But these guys... Uh, and, and I'm Christian. I'm not uh, Muslim, uh, but but you have to understand this is their religion. This is their culture, and it's a very very old culture. Uh, this is their civilization. These are their people, and uh, whether they're they're even a mullah or not, they're they're generals, they're military people, they're they're civilian leaders. There's a point at which uh, they, at being human beings, will say, "Okay, we've been." doing the smart thing by holding back and not being suckered in. But we're now at the point we have to do something or, or we've lost it. And by the way, we're sick of taking it. It's time to start giving some back. And when that point is reached, all hell will literally well, break. I'm going to give you a menu. If I was a Syrian and I was, or Iranian and this was happening, and I don't want to give ideas out, but I want people to understand just how dangerous the situation can get. Number one, already there's probably Syrian and Iranian and Hezbollah fighters. I've heard from my sources that that Iran is already embedded in Mexico and in America and Canada and the West, West. Iranian and Syrian, if you want to call it, special forces agents that are ready to release biological weapons on orders with a text message. Number one. Well, I, we I, have... I, you know, uh, this is something I've warned of for several years, and I've sat down with uh, with generals. Uh, literally, uh, I, I had a meeting with a couple one stars and a two star, and uh, in Indiana, and, and looking at okay, what do we do in in the case uh, of advanced biological war, uh, warfare attack? And they don't have an answer. Because the answer is not there, we'd have well. Not only that, we got the, the other thing is people don't understand that these countries do have access to cobalt sixty, which can be a, we call a dirty nuclear bomb. They do have access to medical waste bombs, which because they do have cyclotrons in these countries, they're advanced countries. They do have advanced fuel air bombs and RDX and VX nerve gas, etc. But the real danger is that. Once we push the button where they realize there's nothing left, there's no restraint anymore, what they can do to us is far worse than what we can imagine. Yeah, and, and, and they can literally, the Iranians can literally kill somewhere between a third and two-thirds of the American civilian population. What they'll do first off, before even all that happens, is within a matter of hours, once people start dying, civilization will paralyze and collapse because nobody will drive, go to work, or manage power stations or anything. Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report. We're now joined with Chris Harris. That's his radio name. That's not his real name. He's one of the uh, top nuclear safety experts in America. And he did some tremendous research. We had one of the nuclear consultants by the name of Hagwood. We're going to post up the actual article, the statement, and there's an audio clip, I think about a minute and a half, that makes a statement, but I think Arnie Gunderson actually put it over on, on, on uh, his website. And I can't believe this, but this is true. If this was, you know, this would actually make a pretty good comedy skit on Saturday Night Live or another comedy thing like Comedy Central. But he actually said two really big lies. As they say, don't make lies. Make them large enough. They're like the uh, seven wonders of the of the of the ancient world size. Number one, Fukushima Daiichi is stable, and number two, there's no technology that exists to deal with it. So, by the way, in quotes. Don't bother me. Don't ask me questions on how to fix it because it's not fixable. But it's stable. Uh, expand on that, Chris, because when I heard yeah. this this morning, I said, I don't know to cry, laugh, or scream. I'm to, I, I, like, I, I wake up in the morning and I think, i got to do another show. I'm going to tell people the truth. i got a lot of spittle I just wiped off from yesterday's show. I'm now showered and got the spittle off. 
I've had all the curses and all the, oh my God, Deagle's crazy, he can't be telling the truth. And now we come up with even their documents and their audio clips in their own voice, and people still don't want to believe it. I call it suicidal, uh, aggressive, vile stupidity. That people don't want to believe that the regulatory agencies, and then we even have Axelrod, who's one of the senior guys who was bouncing around. You can see the back of his head there after Obama's speech. They should play, as I said, kung fu fighting with Romney striking a foot kick to the throat of the idiot Obama in that so-called debate last night. But Axelrod, after the word, is pouncing around trying to tell to kind of spin it to say in the spin. Uh, they call it the spin station the room afterward that yeah really Obama did pretty good I'm thinking uh, you were not in the same dimension as the rest of us Mr. Axelrod but it turns out Axelrod is on the board of Exelon fill us in all the details Chris because you can't invent this stuff this stuff is so over the top even if you're on a toxic fugue on multiple drugs like peyote speed and the blue mess from you know uh from, from that mini series that's spilled there on TV, you know, the blue meth. You couldn't invent this. It's, uh, I'm telling you what, uh, the, the latest, I guess, uh, uh, on October 1st, one of the commissioners of the NRC, uh, and I sent you an audio on that so you could hear him say the words that uh, uh, there is no technology available today to, to clean up the mess that's happening at Fukushima. Basically, as I said a long time ago, I said this is a new, this is a waste generation facility, no longer a nuclear power plant with no off switch. And uh, certain actually, it's a, something else too, Chris, that we should uh, understand. It, believe it or not, it's generating so many millions of becquerels per hour of radiation, but it's actually generating more bull per hour even than radiation. Oh yeah, w- without a doubt. And uh, the number of uh, uh, instead of becquerels, we'll call it BSs per hour. You know, and we call them Terra BSs. How's that? Just like Terra Becquerels, we'll call them Terra BS. Wasn't that the debate last night? <laughs> okay, well, that's yeah. appropriate. Um, yeah, Terra, Terra BS per hour. Actually, we're talking about, you know, uh, gigatons of, of BS, actually. You know, you have to actually have a spaceship move in from interstellar space to drop this thing the size of Texas in terms of the amount of BS. <laughs> And, and certainly, it's, it's uh, bigger than shovelful. There's no question. Oh yeah, you, 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 <laughs> actually, what they had actually is like those fire hoses they use in the in the, all the ports. You know, they can shoot you know four or five hundred yards, and they have this high pressure hose. You know, thousands of pounds per square inch, where they can have this massive hose. It's not shooting water; it's shooting BS. And you got somebody like Obama; he's holding that hose, man, and the hose is waving because it's the pressure is too high for him to hold it, so he's not shooting the BS very well. Uh, no, and we got Axelrod. Axelrod's managing the back here. He's turning the pumps on. I said, I know, Obama, you can hold on to it. I know you're only 180 pounds, but hold on to that BS hose. Mm, that's just bigger than a four inch hose, which would be a standard fire and, hose. And now we got the new director, the new director for the NRC, hose, like, useless. And now we got Axelrod, who's on Exelon's board, bouncing around last night trying to spin. Yeah, by the way, the Green Agenda, if we get Obama in, he's already telling TEPCO, General Electric, which both has Mark One and Mark II reactors, not only in Japan but here, there's over 25 of them in America, and telling Japanese, for God's sake, don't shut down your nuclear plants, even if you're sitting in a nuclear center and you're getting five times more five-plus earthquakes, put them back all on. And believe it or not, Hillary Clinton and Obama are telling the Japanese, please turn the suckers back on. You know what, if I were the Japanese well, you know, mom, we I can't say what I'd tell them on, on the air. But. <laughs> but you can't just design them for uh, a 40 year life in 1966 like uh, Fukushima was and said that a uh, 3.1 meter uh, seawall would be just fine. And now that we find out that they were planning to go to 5.7 meters, and that was not even enough because uh, we're talking about a, a wave that was 14 meters high. So certainly we've got to keep on top of. Um, you know, we have to keep on top of our design bases and keep them up to snuff. But to say that, and just last week, by the way, I didn't get a chance to report it, but I did send you the information was that uh, Unit 1's uh, reactor exhibited a 10 degree Celsius temperature rise. Ooh. And, yeah, yeah and, and that was based on it. I did send you the specific yeah. drawing that shows you where. The I'm going to show. I'm going to actually post the links up so people can go look at it themselves. And you look at it, and now, I don't speak Japanese, although my son does. But I can look at a chart and see it spike, and I say, 
oh my god look at this spike and by the way when you're getting this kind of spike it means you've lost control of the reactor you have criticality and you're probably generating tons of hydrogen so you can have a hydrogen explosion or a nuclear explosion and they're flushing these reactors with nitrogen to reduce the hydrogen generation which also can release radiation or if they're backing off too much or they can't control the temperature because they can't flush enough water in to cool the core of the melted mushy corium which is a nuclear waste site the thing is going to blow up with a nuclear explosion and when it goes up 10 degrees you got to assume that criticality is occurring again it, it's certainly possible that it, that's coming in and out of sporadic criticals we don't know right? uh, a lava lamp you mentioned the term last year you called the lava lamp effect Remember I, that? I, I guess so uh, yeah we try to keep it keep the analogies going i know you you like and you, and there's I like metaphors because the people that are back from my age group, you know, back in the 60s and 70s, is that, yeah, I had a lava lamp years ago and it set my bedroom on fire. <laughs> but, yeah. but, you know, what happens is it kind of globs go down, all of a sudden the globs get together and the light gets real bright and then the kind of lava lamp splits and then it gets a little less bright and more kind of, a, you know, mild. But the lava lamp is constantly in flux. Well, that's what these reactors are like. Well, that's, it certainly could be that way and it seems to be that that, that is the case. Now, let me just go ahead and uh, try to lay out what also uh, Commissioner uh, Matwood said was that not only was there no uh, technology available to clean up this mess, but also that Fukushima appears to be stable. Stable means... Ah, well, stable, means, stable. Uh, right, stable that, means it's control. Stable means there is no more releases going on. Stable means a lot of things that is not that's not true. It, it's certainly not true. And last, uh, on September 10th, there is a trade magazine called Platts. And I'm going to read you just a little bit of an article right here that says that some of the details on how the accident of Japan's Fukushima nuclear power plant that played out has yet to be ter- determined. We do not know. It says, and, and these will not be known for at least five years. Now, that's from last week. That, What's that the name of that magazine again? How's it, how's it spelled oh, again? Okay. P L A P T S is a trade magazine for Platts, right? By the way, all these links are going to be posted up after the show. You'll be able to see it all yourself. And if you say you're a skeptic, keep your spit in your mouth. Don't spit at Deagle or Chris Harris or Tim Alexander. We're just trying to tell you the truth and keep your skepticals on. But once you find the truth, go off and pray. And if you find it's true, do something. Whether it's call your senator or congressman, and raise hell. I still don't have a response from either Senator Wyden's office or Senator Dianne Feinstein here in California, where she's my senator. They're useless. And, well, they certainly... It's, well, let's put it this way. It goes back to the melding of industry and, and uh, regulation. So, yeah, I'm just going to read you one more quick, really important part of this. Is that uh, the manager for TEPCO's nuclear safety, uh, Yamamori Yamanuka, in the uh, engineering group, he said that... Uh, one of, the key pieces, one of the key pieces of information that we've learned in the upcoming years is the location and condition of the core of the nuclear fuel in the reactor. They don't know yet, and we talked about that. So Keep that thought, and we'll be right back, and we'll go over this in just a moment with our nuclear expert, Chris Harris. Welcome back, and... Uh, we got more data to talk about. Let's continue what your other discussion and get into Unit 3 debris accident and the pool damage, et cetera. We talked a little bit about last week, but let's continue with your statement just before the break, uh, Chris. Well, you know, in the, in the very own words of Depco's, the same engineer, I'm going to try to pronounce his name again, Yama, oh, yeah, all right, we're actually, I'm not going to pronounce it again. We did that before. Um, You've destroyed his name already, so let's not do it twice. I don't speak Japanese either. I don't speak Japanese either, but I'm I'm, I'm good at looking at diagrams and drawings and being able to... uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But anyway, um, their own words is that TEPCO believes that the the core is definitely eating through the floor and through the bottom. It's already gone through the bottom of at least Unit 1's. Uh, reactor vessel and it's, eat, and, it's, and it's eating its way through right now the concrete. And uh, I, I, I would believe that's already eaten through the concrete. I think that's past tense, you know. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, but but the idea is that you know every every you know CNN talking heads and all that stuff. That's what really annoyed me. He says, "Don't worry about it. There's a containment. There's this. There's that." I said, "No, no, 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 no. This is." 
this is the worst possible scenario. We're talking about core going through, and if well, core isn't that what they call the China syndrome? And the rest is going to join it. In yeah. The future day. So, yeah, but so that's not actually my words. I, I, I look at that and saying, well, now, now we're finally getting some modicum of proof here. You know, you got the, this was as recent as September 10th. Uh, that's from Tepco's own engineer's words. That's not my words. So it's, it's, uh, we need to put some focus on that. That, okay, uh, let's translate that into here. We had a meeting in Escondido, and it was reported yesterday in the North County News here in Southern California, that they had a meeting with a representative from the uh, Southern California Edison that manages the plant, that they built a 10-mile containment re and, and, and we call emergency zone. Now, I happen to be 12 miles from there, and I monitor, and I know the radi- there's no more radiation because the plant's turned off. I do not want that sucker turned back on. We know that the tubes vibrate. We know that they did not like for like change the engineering design. We know that they were leaking like crazy. They want to block a bunch of tubes and reactivate it. Luckily, the lemon law probably means the taxpayer and the ratepayer isn't going to have to pay for this stupid plant. These new two steam turbines were changed in just the last two years. My next-door neighbor, who now lives in Washington State, was one of the engineers who was fired because, in a sense, he was a whistleblower. He knew that crap was happening, and they were raising issues. And the manager of this plant, which is Southern California Edison, and, of course, they're tied with these big industry, they don't care. They're going to push their green agenda, just like Obama wants to push nuclear down our throat, even with old technology that could be upgraded. Pepple bed reactors, fusion reactors, all kinds of other things. What's going on is safety issues aren't being dealt with, they want to push forward plants, and they want the, still the liability to be carried by the public. So the, if the plant screws up and releases a massive amount of radiation, we have to pay. When the plant loses money because it's no longer online for a year, we got to pay. When the turbines are, are, are defective, and within two years, the Hitachi Corporation that made them, no, no, the Hitachi doesn't have to pay. The American public and the ratepayers have to pay. This is craziness, and they don't even know if they're going to have another meeting to discuss it, but... San Onofre should not be reactivated. Now they should, they should de- de- activate the Diablo Canyon, which is sitting on three converging fault lines. And we have a whole bunch of other reactors now that we know that from the extreme weather, the fault line research data that came out a few weeks ago, that 75% of our major reactors in America are within the strike zone of extreme weather or nuclear fault lines, where they're going to lose backup power, have strategic, you know, we call station blackouts, uh, or lose containment because even Reactor 1, there's evidence that Reactor 1 in, San Onofre, at, in, in TEPCO in Japan at Fukushima, that that reactor already lost containment and had a critical reaction even before the tsunami struck. Isn't that right? And we, I, I want to see that report that shows the real analysis because we need to know that. We need to understand that so that we can prevent that from happening to any other plant. See, well, they also don't know what causes criticality. They're scratching their head and say, gee, we at least shouldn't have blown up. We know reacting cooling pool 3, which is a MOX reactor, literally right. like a shotgun aimed up in space, and they shot pieces of that MOX reactor and plutonium uh, pellets and, detonate, uh, and fuel rod assemblies up to 60 kilometers away from Fukushima. Well, so this don't thing forget, is like don't forget guys that that this yeah, and, and one or like more of these places saw, uh, were probably doing like military reprocessing. Peach, you know, they have peach orchards. I think that's what you call them. Oh yeah, tell us about that. Yeah, you, by the way, Tim mentioned they're doing military reprocessing. Yes. What Japan has been doing is preparing nuclear weapons. Now, here's another story that blew my mind. This is like an SNL, another SNL skit. In Japan, so they can sell their, their Fukushima prefecture peaches, which look beautiful. Sometimes they're pretty mutant, but they're doing <laughs> high-pressure hose cleaning. And then they're not only cleaning the peaches, but also the bark off the trees, which just puts the radioisotopes right back in the ground. So next year's crop will have even more radioisotopes. Tell us about it, Chris, because this is, like, over the top. They're actually high-pressure hosing the crops so you can each have your radioactive peach. Yeah, it looked like they were using the pressure washer. The farmers got together. They, they realized that they're in the crevices of the bark of these, of these beautiful trees uh, were, you know, radioactive contaminants, and they needed to, to clean them out. So they're using... Uh, the same kind of pressure washer that uh, you and I might have in our garage, you know. Um, uh, they're out there and they're spraying these trees so that so they can 
at least knock the knock the contaminants out of the park, and of course they will go into the ground. And so just as you said, then you're talking about perhaps uh, some internal contamination inside of next year's crop. Also, although they'll be very very pretty looking uh, peaches, I don't fault them for what they're trying to do, but they're trying to do something. But I do fault, uh, you know. Uh, you know, all, all the lack of preparation that uh, was made by, by both the uh, Japanese government, our government, too, because, you know, remember, uh, and also the IAEA. I want to tell you what, uh, now they're coming up, the IAEA. We need a plan to mobilize a team in case this happens somewhere in the world. You remember, well, one of the very first things I said is I was a little disappointed. I, that was a, I'm trying to be uh, nice about it. But I was very disappointed that there wasn't already a three stage uh, an action plan, let's say, with some with something that could be deployed rapidly in several sections of the of the globe, and say, hey, anybody who's uh, who's got these plans as a signatory to the to the treaty, you know, it's not just like we give you permission. It's also like we know what we're doing, so that if it goes awry, those who gave you the permission are actually experts in the field. It turns out the opposite. Those who gave the permission or grant a license to to run these things. No, no less than uh, uh, than they should. Let's put it that way. That, that's something that requires remediation. It looks like they're trying to do that, but it's a little too late, I would say. Um, so, if some if someone's going to give you permission to do something, they should be a real expert on. It. Let's put it that way. And um, yeah. they're trying to come up with some some action plan now, but it's it's not going to. It's 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 already too late for for Fukushima. It's probably too late for other plants that are that are constructed on. But, you know, no, this is a, a, Chris, this is a continuing problem because these things are giant generators of poison, and they're they're in the process of poisoning the entire Pacific and the basin. Well, here's what's going to happen. We have that. Now we have this zone of 10 kilometers inside Syria that's being shelled by Turkey. They opened up last Sunday evening. I don't know if you watched the series uh, Homeland. But I looked at it, and my heart stopped. I flatlined when they actually brought in the storyline, the narrative, that in this series where they turned an American military person who was eight years in prison who is now a congressman nominated to become vice presidential candidate, they brought in this story that Israel, in the in the storyline, had already bombed five sites in Iran, including the Bashir live reactor and four other sites. I mean, if this happens, you can't imagine what's going to happen. I mean, this is this is beyond belief what will happen. Over a million you know, people, right, within... No, what we actually calculated from the society with it, with the uh, the uh, physicians for social responsibility have estimated within the first thirty days, thirty million people will die. Thirty, 30 million. million. Thirty million. Wow! And that's only the start. And we're talking about a live reactor. Plus, it's going to precipitate a thermonuclear exchange. And we're not just talking about a little party. We're talking about missiles curving in with multiple targeted warheads that can evade our so-called anti-defense systems heading toward Los Angeles, Chicago, Atlanta, and every other city, over 50,000, and vaporizing them to obsidian glass, like Azerbaijan, India, that was investigated by my chemistry professor back in 1972 that proved that we had a nuclear war 12,600, 800 years ago. So we blew ourselves to kingdom come then, and we're getting ready to do it now. Some more evidence also. Right. It's just like the, uh, it's like Battlestar Galactica. This has happened before, and mankind is about to do it again. Only this time, we're going to do a better job. Not even cockroaches will have a place to hide under a rock. Oh, goody. <laughs> so... Whoever becomes president, we better not keep uh, get him too close to the nuclear football. Keep praying, everybody. Get right with God.